Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sam Drew with the National Dropout Prevention Center, and I'm here with my co-host and colleague, Marty Duncanfield, also with the center. We welcome all of you to this monthly radio webcast brought to you by the National Dropout Prevention Center Network at Clemson University in partnership with Clemson Radio Productions and the generous support of our partner, Penn Foster. Welcome again to Solutions, and a special welcome to our first-time listeners. We are delighted to have you with us for this live broadcast focusing on solutions to the dropout crisis. Today's broadcast marks the first for us, Sam, the first time our guest is actually with us in the studio. Yeah, it's wonderful to have someone here face-to-face. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're going to enjoy this today, I know. But first, we have uh, some excellent resources for you on the website, which I, I'd like to take a moment to direct you to, uh, the www.dropoutprevention.org slash webcast. First and most importantly for the program today is the slideshow, which is a PowerPoint for today's webcast. There are also some really outstanding resources. There's PDFs, there's websites, and for the first time, Sam, we have some videos as well, which we've been uh, filming over the past few months, and we'd like you to review them after the broadcast, and, and actually many of these uh, resources we'll be referring to this afternoon. As always, we invite you to be an active part of the program today, so we encourage you to call in your questions for our guest. Our toll-free call-in number is 888-539-8859, and for those calling outside the U.S., the number is 864-656-4550. You may begin calling in now or any time during the program. We'll put you on hold for a few minutes, but we'll try and get to as many of your calls and your questions as we can during the broadcast. And that's important enough to repeat, um, although we may hold you on the phone for a little while. Um, maintain um, the phone, keep holding, and we promise you we'll get to your question. Um, you know, as always, this program is about solutions to the dropout crisis, and today we're focusing our attention on the issue of bullying. Um, bullying has been around for a long time. All of us, most of us at least, um, can relate some experience about bullying, either uh, someone we knew who was bullied or maybe we've been bullied ourselves. But um, bullying is causing torment, really, to many young people, and its effects are highly related to dropout. Um, we'll cover some of that later. But uh, it's really only been in recent years that we've begun to gather a research base, um, and research-based solutions have been implemented to um, to combat this phenomenon. Um, our special guest today, we're very pleased to have Dr. Susan Limber. She's one of our Clemson University colleagues, and she's an internationally recognized expert on bullying prevention. She is a faculty member in the Institute on Family and Neighborhood Life, and as you may have seen from the information that we disseminated about this program, she actually directed the first wide-scale implementation and evaluation of the Oveas Bullying Prevention Program in the United States. And um, Dr. Limber, we're really delighted to have you with us today. Sue, if we can call you that. Absolutely. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. Good. Well, we'll begin our conversation with Sue in just a moment, but I wanted to remind our listeners that this is a call-in program, and we will be providing opportunities for you to ask questions of our guests periodically. We want you to take advantage of that. Um, and that number again, toll free in the United States is 888-539-8859. If you are one of our international listeners, I'm um, afraid there is a toll for this number, but we do want to hear from you. And that number is 865-656-4550. And that, I have a correction. It's 864 656 Four five five zero. Once again, eight six four six five six four five five zero. Sue, maybe we could um, start the program today with you really helping us all understand just what bullying is and and the kind of effect that bullying has on children. Sure, happy to. Um, if folks want to turn to their second slide. Um, it's worth pointing out, I think, that researchers and practitioners generally agree that bullying has three defining characteristics. First of all, it's aggressive, intentional behavior. 
Um, secondly, it typically is repeated over time. Um, it, there's a pattern to this behavior. And third, and, and very importantly, bullying occurs in a relationship where there's an imbalance of power or strength so that a, a child has a difficult time defending him or herself. Now, power can assert itself in different ways. Sometimes that's physical power, but often it's, it's verbal or emotional or social power or power in numbers. Um, if you'd like to turn to the next slide, I think it's important not only to understand what bullying is, but also what bullying is not. Um, we think of bullying as a form of victimization or peer abuse. It's, it's not a form of conflict, and I think it's important to keep in mind that any two people can have a conflict. It's really only bullying when there's this, this power imbalance. Why is this difference between bullying and conflict so important? Um, one reason is that conflict resolution and peer mediation strategies are sometimes misused to try to deal uh, with bullying problems. And I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit um, later, that these strategies are probably not the most effective in, in a case of victimization. The next slide, number four, um, gives us a, some insight as to what the most common forms of bullying are. These are data from the National Crime Victimization Survey of 12 to 18-year-olds. And as you can see by the, the graph, the most common form of bullying is not physical bullying, which I think we often think of um, when we think of bullying, but in fact it's verbal bullying, both for boys and girls. And this is followed by rumor spreading, then physical forms of bullying, threaten, uh, threatening others, social isolation, and property dis destruction. Um, I mentioned that verbal is the most common form of bullying. That includes a lot of different things, name-calling, uh, taunting, teasing others. If you want to turn to the next slide, I, I want to mention a little bit about the, the, the really dramatic increase in our knowledge about bullying in recent years. Research has really increased um, in the last five to ten years. We know simply so much more about this behavior than, than we did several years ago. And, uh, I'll try to summarize some of this research in about five minutes and a few key findings or maybe take-home messages about bullying that have particularly informed our work with the Olveus program. And I'll begin with one that perhaps seems very obvious to most of us, and that is that many children are involved in bullying situations, and most are, are really very concerned about it. Slide number six gives us a sense of what is the prevalence of bullying um, a survey done back in 2001 that was nationally representative um, here in the United States of about 15,000 6th through 10th graders found that 19 percent, nearly 20 percent, admitted that they bullied others, not ever, but sometimes or more frequently within a, a single school semester. Uh, Nine percent, in fact, said they bullied others weekly, pretty persistently. What about the victimization end? About 17% said they were bullied with some regularity, 8% weekly. And then of concern, these researchers found that 6% of kids said that they both bullied others and were bullied themselves. Um, we can talk about that group of kids perhaps a little bit later. Often we call, refer to those kids as provocative victims or bully victims involved, both as victims and as in perpetrators. In addition to being very prevalent, bullying is something that often tops kids' lists of concerns of things that they worry about, things that they fear at school. Um, slide number seven raises a second key finding about bullying, which is that, that bullying can seriously affect kids who are targeted. Bullying isn't just um, a matter of kids being kids. It can be very serious for, for children. And um, on slide number eight, I list out a little bit of what we know from research on the short-term effects of, of bullying on victims. And I think many of these findings will ring true to the listeners who, who know kids who have suffered from bullying on a, on a regular basis. We really know that bullying can affect the psychosocial functioning, the academic work, even the health of kids who are targeted. Um, bully victimization has been found to be related to low self-esteem, higher rates of loneliness, anxiety, um, much higher rates of depression. Uh, kids who are bullied are, are more likely to think about taking their own lives. In fact, a study in Australia found that 
Uh, for those kids who were bullied at least once a week, they were about twice as likely as their peers to uh, wish they were dead or, or think about taking their own lives. For suicide is relatively rare, but um, horrific, and, and certainly we hear every year, it seems, uh, cases of kids who have been persistently bullied and felt like they just couldn't take it any longer. And finally, some recent studies have uh, indicated that children who are frequently bullied also report a variety of health problems, uh, apparently uh, are often related to stress and anxiety that they've experienced. So kids who are bullied uh, suffer more headaches, stomach aches, um, sleep problems than other kids. And as slide number nine highlights, we also know that there have been a number of studies that have focused on the effects of bullying on school engagement, academic achievement. So we know that bullied children are more likely to want to avoid going to school, understandably, if that's where they're being targeted. Uh, they, in fact, do have higher absenteeism rates. They often are more likely to say they dislike school. And some initial studies really showing that their, their grades and achievement scores can suffer. Yeah, and um, that last slide, slide in particular um, is interesting to me because we can certainly see uh, the relationship of um, these kinds of consequences to children dropping out of school. Uh, we Absolutely. know that there is a high correlation with um, dislike of school and absenteeism and low test scores or, or low grades. Absolutely. The research in the bullying field is catching up, but it, it's confirming what, what many of us in schools know is that the kids um, are going to try to avoid the place where they're being tormented. Um, it occurs to me also, as you talk about the um, effects, short-term and long-term effects of bullying on victims, that there might also be effects on the perpetrators, um, the, the kids that are doing the bullying. Is there research um, that, that points out what effects there might be? Yeah, there, there has been a good bit of research, you know, raising concern about the kids doing the bullying, that we know that often kids who bully others, that's not the only... Uh, worrisome behavior they're often involved in. Kids who bully are often uh, more likely to get in, in fights with other kids, to be truant from school, um, to have some academic problems in school, um, to damage property. So in many cases, bullying can be an early warning sign or sort of the tip of the iceberg. Um, so there's real concern for, for intervening early to make sure that we address these behaviors. Well, and I don't want to preempt um, our callers' um, questions, but and I'll probably get into trouble for saying this, but um, I have heard from, from some students as we move around the country and interview students in schools, and not specifically about bullying even, but um, we hear from some students that, um, that girls are more likely to bully or, and or to be bullied than boys. Is there any truth to that? Well, that's a good question. I think there is a lot of debate uh, about the involvement of girls and boys in bullying. I think the most important message is that both girls and boys are involved, both as being bullied and bullying others. Most research that uses self-report or anonymous questionnaires still shows that, that boys are overrepresented. But that, that isn't to diminish the, the bullying that, that mm -hmm. girls are involved in or the, the harm that it can cause. Um, we do know that girls and boys are involved in different types of bullying, which is really important to, to know and to be looking for. Although both boys and girls use verbal bullying the most, boys are more likely than girls to be involved in the physical forms of bullying, whereas girls are more likely to use the more indirect social exclusion, the rumor spreading. We also know that um, boys are are typically bullied by other boys, but girls are often bullied by both boys and girls. So that's, again, something for educators and parents to be on the lookout for. Mm -hmm. I think this has been really helpful to kind of uh, broaden the definition that many of us have had about what bullying is so we can actually identify it and, and do something about it. And uh, it looks like, Sam, you've got some competition here for questions. Uh, is it Chez, Chez from Indianapolis, Indiana, who may have a question for Sue Limber. Oh, we're still getting their information. Okay, well then you may not have competition. But uh, what I, but I'm really kind of uh, interested in this. Is there any kind of way uh, that uh, that's out there to uh, help 
adults and others identify uh, who is being bullied? Is there some testing, that kind of thing? Sure. There are a number of different ways. Most... Um most uh, there are a number of different instruments, for example, to try to assess the prevalence of bullying. Mm-hmm. Usually, those are anonymous kinds of measures so that you can get kids' most honest responses. But there are also a number of uh, checklists of warning signs that mm-hmm. adults can look for, and a couple of the websites that I uh, have listed on on your website point people to, you know, some of those checklists of warning signs. What what can adults, in other words, look for? Um, are kids, are children's behavior changing dramatically? Have their grades dropped? Are they taking a different route to school? Are there, you know, bruises on their body? There are a lot of different um, things that parents can look for um, to open the dialogue with kids to ask them about anything that might be of concern and, and whether bullying is a problem for them. And, and a school could actually do some type of, using one of these instruments, a survey to see if their school is is not really a very safe place for children because a lot of bullying perhaps is going on. I think that's important for any school to do. We as adults often think we have a handle on the kind of bullying that may occur at our school or how much is going on, but I have yet to see a a school that's not surprised by some of the findings from their kids, how much is going on, where it's occurring, the kinds of bullying. I think it's it's just invaluable information for school. Okay, well, thank you. I think it's time to move on. we have a caller who was just listening, so okay, we'll, we'll move on to, to, uh, to yeah, the Yeah, and thing. this is a good, uh, a good transition, really, because I, I was uh, going to say, and I know you have information um, in your presentation uh, about the role of adults and peer contacts. Sure. We, we talk more about the kids and the ones bullying, doing the bullying and being bullied, and we know that and from what you've just said that... Adults have a big role to play, and so do peers. They do, and, and they're critical in terms of prevention and intervention. Um, slide 10, I, I raised sort of a, a third key finding about bullying, which is that unfortunately, despite the very high prevalence of bullying that we just talked about and the harm that it can cause kids, um, substantial numbers of children don't report their victimization, at least not to adults, not to parents or to adults at school, and and estimates vary, but studies find find that among victimized kids, fewer than half typically have reported their bullying uh, experiences. And so wouldn't this uh, also be in a situation where children don't know what bullying is? They may not. They they may recognize that they're being uh, treated in a way that's making them feel miserable, Um, as well as often kids are embarrassed about it. Mm -hmm. Um, We know, in fact, if if you turn to the next slide, we know that boys and older kids are particularly uh, reluctant to report their bullying. Why? Well, for boys, it's, it's, you know, it it may be seen as um, not very macho, a sign of weakness. Um, And as well, younger kids are more likely to report. So those those are real concerns. Um, What? You know, why else are kids reluctant to report their experiences in, a turn, in, in, in addition to embarrassment? I, I think that some of this reluctance um, really reflects, unfortunately, a lack of confidence in teachers and, and administrators' handling of bullying incidences and reports. For example, on slide 11, I highlight um, some findings from a survey of high school students here in the United States. And Two-thirds of those who had been bullied believed that the school personnel responded poorly to the incidents at school, and only about 6% felt that the staff handled the problems well. Um, This isn't to to bash teachers or administrators. I think it it points out that um, bullying can be very difficult for us as adults to identify. Kids don't tell us about it, and it can be be hard to, to sort of hone in on. On slide uh, 12, a related key finding is that we as adults, unfortunately, aren't as responsive to bullying as we should be and and as kids want us to believe. Um, On the next slide, slide 13, where we look at adults' responsiveness to bullying, um, we know that adults in the school environment, unfortunately, fairly dramatically overestimate our effectiveness in identifying and in intervening in bullying uh, situations. Seventy percent, in fact, of teachers in one study believed that, when asked, that teachers intervened almost always in bullying situations. When students in the school were asked, 
um, the same question, about 25% of the students agreed with this assessment. Um, again, um, I think these findings suggest that teachers are simply unaware of a lot of the bullying going on around them. Well, we want to just intervene here right now and give out that phone number. It's been a few minutes since we've done that. So we'll be happy to take your calls at 888-539-8859 and for outside the U.S., 864-656-4550. And uh, our questions are for Dr. Sue Limber, who is talking about bullying prevention. You know, uh, Sue, let me um, comment on this also, um, the the conversation we've just had about uh, adults overestimating their effectiveness. We also see this discrepancy in other research on discipline. I'm sure you're well aware mm-hmm. of that. Um, uh, for example, and, and often it's reversed, and it has to do with place or location of a, of a, of a problem, whether that is bullying or some other kind of, um, of discipline problem, um, where kids will say um, – 70% of them uh, or more will say that, yes, the locker rooms, for instance, in mm-hmm. school it's, is a, a big place where bullying takes place or other kinds of discipline problems. Um, school staff, on the other hand, have a very different perception. Exactly and about right. 25% of those might say that, no, that's a safe place. Nothing happens there. And well, and, you know, that's a great point. It gets back to the, the need to, to ask kids themselves. And For example, uh, one of the things that most surprises teachers is the location for bullying. I think they recognize the playground or hallways as hot spots, but in fact, often the classroom itself is a hot spot for bullying. All of a sudden, the phone board is, is lighting up, Sue. Great. So uh, we'll have a few calls for you in just a minute. Let's keep on going here, okay? wanted to say a few things, if, if folks would turn to their next slide, uh, 14, about um, students' perceptions of adult actions. I think what may be even more disturbing is is the fact that many children, I think, also question the commitment of teachers and administrators to stopping bullying. Um, for example, in one study of ninth grade students, only about a third believed that their teachers were really interested in stopping bullying. Forty percent reported they didn't know if their teachers were interested in, in putting an end to bullying, and 21 percent that their teacher felt that their teachers were definitely not interested. Even fewer students felt that in administrators were really committed. Um, I hope that this is a, a dramatic underest, uh, underestimate of, and I, I believe that to be the, the case, that adults do care about bullying, but in many cases, kids aren't picking that up from us. Well, we, we do have a call, actually, on this particular topic. Janet from Fort Myers, Florida. You have a question for Sue Limber? Yes. Um, I was interested in the fact that I, I certainly know that we teachers, administrators, don't always respond as they should. And I guess I would just like, um, Sue, to maybe talk to what kinds of things do adults generally uh, do? How do they generally respond versus how should we be responding to these when a child, you know, complains, especially uh, initial incidents uh, about bullying? That's a great question, Janet. Um, you know, it's, it reminds me of when we did some focus groups with kids. Um, one boy turned to the adult in the room and, in fact, pointed his finger, and he said, you know, you adults, <laughs> either way overreact to bullying or way underreact to bullying, you hardly ever get it right. And, you know, he, I think he may be right. It doesn't mean that we don't care and that we're not trying. Um, I think adults respond in very different ways, and it's difficult to overgeneralize. Um, I think what kids tell us is not helpful (laughs) is for adults to tell them to try to deal with it on their own, that it would be good for them to toughen up, and, in fact, it's healthy to learn how to deal with bullying on your own. Kids tell us very clearly that sometimes they cannot do that on their own, and it really is adults' responsibilities to help keep kids safe at school. So I think the first and most important thing that we can do as adults is to take their concerns seriously, um, and not to to brush them off, even inadvertently. We're busy in school. We don't often have time to deal with it on the spot. Um, I think, um, so I think, you know, taking them seriously and really listening and trying to investigate, you know, what what led to this 
uh, report on their, their part. We have to recognize it takes a lot of guts on the part of a child to come forward to an adult. So investigate, ask questions about what kind of bullying, when did it happen, where did it occur, and uh, we can't promise kids necessarily that it will stop, but we can promise them that we'll do everything that we can to put an end to it. So I think what that means is make sure that they're emotionally okay, check back in with them, refer to a counselor if we need to, and then work very quickly and, and hard behind the scenes to talk with other adults at the school to find out how we can uh, keep an eye on things, intervene with the children or children who have been doing the bullying and really set some, some ground rules for their behavior. Very good. Thank you. Thank well, you, Janet. Well, thank you, Janet, for calling in. And uh, Sue, um, do you want to carry forward here? Sure. Um, on slide 15, I, I wanted to highlight that even though we often think of bullying as involving perhaps just a couple of kids, a, a child who's doing the bullying, a child who's being bullied, in fact, bullying is... is m is, I think, better understood as a group phenomenon in which kids can play a variety of roles. And if you turn to the next slide, slide 16, Dan Alvaeus developed this diagram, that, which he refers to as the bullying circle, to really help to depict the wide variety of roles that students can play in bullying incidents as it sort of depicts their attitudes and behaviors. And you'll see that there's the, the bullied student um, in the center of this circle and the students who initiate the bullying in positions A and, and um, B. And, and what you see here is if you look around the circle, there are followers and supporters of the, the children doing the bullying. There are more passive players in, in most bullying situations as well, passive supporters, kids who like the bullying, but they may not op display open support. Lots of disengaged onlookers who may stand by and watch. Um, the good news is, however, that in also in most cases of bullying, there are um, kids on the right hand of the circle, the defenders or possible defenders who play, really play key roles in helping to stop bullying. Kids who dislike the bullying and maybe think it ought to stop but aren't quite sure what to do. And there are also heroes in every school, kids who really do stick their necks out either to say something or to involve adults. So the goal, I think, of bullying prevention efforts are really to try to move children along this circle from left to right to reduce the numbers of kids on the left side and increase the, the confidence and the skills, um, skill level of the kids in the school so they can play more of the defender roles. In the next slide, I, I want to highlight what we know about sort of the good and the bad news about peer attitudes and actions relating to bully. I think the good news is that most kids, research suggests, do have sympathy for bullied children. And in one study of middle schoolers, for example, 80% said they felt sorry for victims of bullying. Um, the bad news, of course, is that, that sympathy doesn't always translate into action. In that same survey, 64% said that other students try to prevent bullying only once in a while or maybe even never. Okay, we have a call from Joan from Pennsylvania. Joan, you're on the air with Sue Limber. Do you have a question for her? I do. Hi, Marty and Sam and Dr. Limber. Hi, Joan. Um, Hi. I have a question. I, I'm wondering, as I'm listening to you talking about, you know, how we need to work with young people and look at bullying, have you all looked at um, that sometimes teachers don't respond in ways that are appropriate because maybe they have been victims or continue to be victims of bullying themselves. Um, I work with a number of different schools and often have seen kind of environments that almost the adults are bullied, you know, mm -hmm. with my administration, new teachers who try to be sympathetic, um, you know, um, and stick their necks out for kids are, are kind of bullied by the other teachers to let kids kind of tough it out. And do you have any, um, have you seen, seen any of that and the effects of, of that kind of, um, culture of bullying? Well, you people? know, you, you use a good, great phrase there. It is a culture of yeah. bullying, and we see that in, in many, many schools, unfortunately. Um, it, it's not just an issue for kids, of course. Um, workplace bullying is a very hot topic right now, and, and schools are not immune to that either. Um, it seems that when, when you go into a school or when a school itself starts to raise awareness about bullying, these questions invariably come up. 
Uh, it's not just an issue for kids. I think everybody in the school environment, administrators, teachers, we all have to take a close look at our own behavior and recognize that any rules that we lay down for kids about not bullying others and how to be uh, good good uh, interveners or bystanders really need to apply to all of us. And if we're not, as a school or any workplace, really willing to look at our own behavior, I think the kids will see that as, as a bit false. Well, thank you, Joan, for calling in. I think it's a good transition to the next slide. Don't you think, Sue? Yeah, you know, I've, we're often asked, so there's been a lot of awareness raised about bullying in recent years. We know much more about it. So what is it that schools are doing to respond? And the answer is schools are doing a lot of different things to respond to bullying. Uh, there's, there's little or no official tracking of schools' anti-bullying efforts here in the United States. So this is a non-scientific um, list on slide number 18 of, of the types of responses that I've seen in a school environment to, to deal with bullying. Um, and they range, as you can, you can see, from nothing, meaning that some schools... Um, are not doing anything still in a sy systemic sort of way to address bullying or even utter the words bullying. Individual teachers may be dealing with it as it arises, but some schools really are not yet addressing bullying. Um, many others are raising awareness through assemblies or PTA meetings, um, simply trying to better understand and help children and teachers better understand the prevalence and the harms that it causes, which is a good thing. Um, others, perhaps um, nudged a bit by some legislation, um, are doing a, a good job of reporting and tracking incidences of bullying. Um, others, and I wouldn't recommend this, are, are moving towards zero tolerance or student exclusion policies towards bullying, perhaps suspending or expelling kids who bully others. And if, if there's interest later, we can talk about why that may or may not be a, such a great policy. Others are focusing on, on the victims of bullying appropriately, um, perhaps recognizing they need support or social skills training in some cases. Um, others um, look at the children who are doing the bullying and, and are looking at uh, individual or perhaps even group treatment for kids who bully. And that may or may not be such a good idea, and we can talk about that later as well. I alluded earlier to... Uh, the use of mediation or conflict resolution programs. Many schools have those in place and, and have said, well, why not use these for cases of bullying? As I alluded to early, uh, earlier, that's not such a good idea. Perhaps fine in cases of, of conflict between two kids, but we find in, in trying to mediate bullying between kids, you can often re-victimize a child who's been bullied, and it sends an inappropriate message often that you're both partly right, but both partly wrong. We're just trying to work out this conflict between you. We have seen an explosion as well in the number of curricular approaches to bullying prevention. And finally, an increasing number of schools are really adopting comprehensive programs to, to address bullying, whereby the entire school is really engaged in a number of different efforts um, to prevent and deal with bullying as it occurs. So here's a, a, a laundry list, and it probably doesn't include all the efforts of, of folks out there trying to address bullying. Well, we want to remind our listeners that uh, you have an opportunity to ask questions of our guest, Dr. Sue Limber, about bullying, bully prevention in your schools and communities, and our toll-free number is 888-539-539. 8859, and if you're outside the U.S., it's 864-656-4550. Sue, I want to come back. Uh, I, want, I want to go back um, because this does have to do with, um, uh, with adult roles um, in bullying to a statement that you made, um, and actually coming from the research uh, that shows us that um, boys often don't report bullying or they don't report at a higher degree than girls do, and that um, this could be related, at least, to it not being macho. Mm -hmm. um, you know, often uh, we hear, we, we know that, uh, that, that parents don't want their children bullied, but often the answer that they have is that, uh, to their child is that you've, you've got to stand up for yourself. 
Um, right. um, I think I heard that from my father when I was right, young. Right. And, and certainly um, you do want kids to be able to stand up for themselves, but, but why is this not really a good solution for bullying, even if a child does stand up for himself or herself? Why would that uh, possibly not end the bullying? Well, for for one thing, I mean, kids will tell us how difficult <laughs> that is to do, and and we know that that often, um, you know, kids who bully will keep escalating the behavior. If they don't get the response that they want, meaning uh, a, a child who's cowering, sometimes even if a child stands up, sometimes that that stands up for themselves. Sometimes that can. Um, make the the bully move on to somebody else, which is not a good thing necessarily, mm-hmm. um, and other times it, it may just escalate their behavior. Um, I think if you if you look at it from a systemic standpoint, we we want to make sure that the child who's bullying doesn't just move on to some other target because um, there will be other targets out there. We really need to make sure we address their behavior, and I think that's the responsibility of all adults, parents included, to be concerned about all the kids. Um, in that school environment. One of the things that struck me in in listening to this and what you hear in the press, certainly when there have been these school shootings, Mm -hmm. is that oftentimes the perpetrator had been bullied. And uh, do you have any comments about that? Well, you know, that's a great point, Marty. There have been some retrospective studies of these school shootings. The Secret um, Secret Service and the Department of Education partnered on one of those studies and really found... Um, that in about two-thirds of those instances, um, to the best of their ability to put pieces together, there, there appeared to be some bullying involved. Um, I alluded earlier to the group of kids, that 6% of bully victims, kids who were bullied but also bullied others. And there's some, some would suggest or, or hypothesize that these may be the kids involved in some of these rare but horrific instances where kids are bullied and simply feel like they can't take it anymore and, and, and planfully, in many cases, um, decide to put a stop to it in, in, in really horrific ways. Actually, that's so true. Uh, we have a call from Linda from Anderson, South Carolina. And, Linda, you're on the air with uh, Sue Limber. Do you have a question for her? Yes. Hello, Sue and Sam and Marty. Hey, Linda. I wondered if you would address the educator's role in cyberbullying. Boy, that's a hot topic, mm-hmm. isn't it? Um, I've I've done some research on cyberbullying and, and have really been interested at, uh, with the phenomenon of how it's growing. <laughs> you know, the behavior in some ways is not so different from traditional forms of bullying, but the medium is very different. And there, there are aspects of cyberbullying that can make it particularly challenging for adults and particularly educators. Um, I think from the educator's standpoint, one of the really tricky things about cyberbullying is it often, or in fact usually, doesn't occur at school. Um, Sometimes it can through cell phones, but usually it occurs off school grounds. But we know that um, even cyberbullying or any kind of bullying that is initiated off school the school campus can affect and, in fact, as kids say, bleeds into the school day, and they can bring in all of these concerns and worries, and it can really disrupt the school environment. So even though it may not originate at school, I I believe firmly that, that educators do have very important roles to play in helping to prevent and even deal with cyberbullying. There may be constitutional issues that, that arise, certainly there are, and we may be limited in, in our ability to sanction kids because of First Amendment and other concerns for speech that occurs off school campus. Um, but I think there's a lot we can do to prevent and raise awareness and help parents understand what cyberbullying is and how, how to deal with it. And there's a lot that we can do to help victims of cyberbullying deal with that and to make sure that kids involved in cyberbullying aren't involved in other forms of bullying as well. Uh, this is one of the websites that we did have on the resource page that you gave us. Is one about cyberbullying, which really seems to escalate the whole impact of bullying. And which brings us, I think, Sam, don't you think, to the prevention component of our program today of, of starting with children when they're younger to uh, change their thinking about 
uh, how they treat others. I think it does. And uh, I wanted to say that um, last month the um, solutions team um, made uh, a trip out to Forest Lake, Minnesota, and, and we had the privilege of visiting the Central Montessori School, one of the Forest Lake Elementary Schools. And there, Principal Gail McGrain and her staff uh, were gracious hosts and hostesses, and we were able to actually observe the Olvaeus Bullying Prevention Program in action. Um, and uh, as you were going, uh, Gail, through your bullying circle, it was real interesting to see how um, that was conveyed to students, mm -hmm. and they were actually given a terminology, you know, for bullying as well as um, specific skills, you know, to, to com uh, combat this. Uh, we did film um, our visit there, and we've edited that into um, a short um, that is on a short uh, film that is on the website for you to review um, later. So be sure and, and make use of, of that resource. It gives you a really good overview of how this program um, um, plays out. You know, Sam, um, she must have known we were going to talk about her because Gail McGrain is, is on the phone right now. So, <laughs> so hello, hey, Gail. Hello, Gail. Um, <laughs> welcome. It's good to have you join us and meet Sue Limber. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Actually, I didn't know you were going to talk about me, and I had a question about the cyberbullying sure. for Dr. Limber. Sure. Well, we said all good things about you, Gail. I, I heard you say that. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> Dr. Limber, my question for you about the cyberbullying is have you seen anything, because that's something we are experiencing at the secondary level more so than elementary at this mm -hmm. point, have you found anything that schools can use with teeth in it um, to address that issue? Um, you know, we do have kids come with it, and we do see it bleeding into school, and that's the format we use. But have you seen anything that schools have used that have some teeth to affect change on it? And that's a great question. The, the, the law is evolving <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. right now on these issues. So, you know, what I would recommend and what I think will have teeth to it is to, to make sure it is on the prevention side perhaps – uh, a safer side than the sanction side because that is a bit murky or can be a bit work murky. Um, I'm, I'm working right now with some colleagues on a, a curriculum uh, for, for cyberbullying in the middle and uh, elementary, middle, and high schools right now. And there are other tools out there. I, I think what does have teeth, Gail, to really get to your question, is opening that dialogue. Kids tell us that um, it, there's a lot going on and that, unfortunately, adults aren't talking about it a lot with them. You know, they may be addressing cyber safety issues, but not perhaps talking about the bullying aspect and what to do about it. So I think right now I really recommend making sure um, you set aside time in, in your, your school day, not just to talk about bullying with kids, but to, to open that conversation and make sure parents are part of that conversation Boy, we adults, I include myself, are so far behind kids. And I think in terms of right. our techno-savvy, you know, and I think we can feel lost and as if we'll never catch up. But we can. There's a lot. There are a lot of great resources out there to help increase both educators' and parents' knowledge. And I think if we do that, I think that's going to have the most teeth. I, and I, I agree with you. I know we focus on it at school, both elementary, secondary, on the – bullying in the bully circle, I don't think we have addressed the cyberbullying mm -hmm. in a preventative way enough. That's really good feedback. Well, Thank here. you no, very I, much. You're welcome. Thanks, Gail. Yeah, thanks for calling, Gail. Thank you, you're Gail. Welcome. Thank you, Bye. Gail, and thank you for the opportunity um, for us to, to visit with your school, and that gives us an opportunity, um, Sue, to um, ask you to, to give us an overview of the OVS Bullying Prevention Program. Well, it was, it was my my real pleasure back in the early 1990s to um, be involved in the first implementation and evaluation program working hand-in-hand -hand with Dan Oveas here, right here in South Carolina, in fact. And we here at Clemson are now the hub for the Oveas program in the United States. And we now have trainers in about 39 states plus the District of Columbia. So let me say a little bit about the program, a few snippets, um, just to sort of open the door um, give people a glimpse for what a comprehensive program looks like and what it can do. 
if folks want to turn to slide number 20 that, that has a, a pictorial dis, um, sort of a picture of the various po program components, um, let me say just a few things. Research really shows that bullying prevention, I think, needs to happen on multiple levels in order to be effective. And so recognizing this, the Alveas program um, has four primary components, school-level components, classroom-level components, individual components, and community-level components. And we show them here as sort of interlocking puzzle pieces to show that they're all critical. Um, parents are important for the success of the Olveus program and are in the middle because they're involved at all four of those levels. So let me just say a few things about each of these four levels of the program in just a couple minutes. First, though, on the next slide, slide number 21, I want to say a few things about what the, the Olveus program is and then what it isn't. The Olveus uh, program is a universal, a, a school-wide effort that involves all of the adults and all of the, the students in the school community, not just the teachers, but administrators, uh, school counselors, cafeteria staff, custodial staff, bus drivers, librarians, parents, really all members of the school community and the broader community of, of, of folks who interact with the school. Um, second, it's concerned both with preventing bullying and with dealing with bullying situations as they arise. Um, it's focused on the, the changing the climate of the school. I think that, that phrase came up from a, a caller earlier, and that's really what it's all about, changing the, the, the climate and the social norms so that bullying isn't cool anymore and that so that children really aren't marginalized or left on the outside. The Olveus program has a, a very strong and a growing research base, not just in Norway but here in the United States, and, and importantly, it doesn't have an end date. Um, this and other comprehensive bullying prevention programs really should be woven into the fabric of the school, of the everyday school life. The next slide highlights a little bit of what the Pro Olveus program is not. Um, although there are some very user-friendly classroom support materials, quite a few of them, in fact, this is not a curriculum. I mentioned earlier um, that it's not a conflict or that conflict resolution programs for peer mediation programs really are not appropriate in bullying situations, and that's not what this is about. And as well, it's worth pointing out that bullying often is not motivated by anger, so the program really isn't focused on anger management. The next slide I, I won't spend a lot of time on. I, I simply wanted to highlight that, as I mentioned, that there's a strong and a growing research base for the program. It's, it's been recognized um, as a blueprint model program and by a number of different um, uh, branches of, fed of the federal government as a, a model bullying prevention program. I can say more about that later if folks are interested. But let me move on to the next slide, which is what are the goals of the program? And then following that, what are the, the guiding principles behind it? Very straightforward goals. We, we want to reduce our existing bullying problems, prevent new ones from cropping up, and, and really generally achieve better peer relations at the school. How do we meet these goals? It's really by restructuring that school environment so that both the opportunities and the rewards for bullying behavior are reduced. The next slide highlights the four guiding principles of the Olveus program, which have been derived from research on reducing aggressive behavior among kids. And none of these will be surprises, I don't think. Uh, the first is that warmth and positive interest and involvement really are critical on the part of the adults at the school. Second, that it's, in, it's critical to set very firm limits to unacceptable behaviors. Um, third, that adults should very consistently use non-hostile, non-physical consequences when these rules are bro broken. And finally, that adults in the school really need to act as authoritative authorities and positive role models. The next slide really begins to um, highlight some of the key components at the school level. So what, what happens school-wide with the Olveus program? There, there are nine school-level elements of the program, and I'll mention just a few points about each to give folks a flavor of, of the program that happens school-wide. The first component is the 
is to establish a bullying prevention coordinating committee. What is this? It's, it's a representative group of perhaps 9 to 12 members of the school who really are the engine behind the program. They design the program as it's implemented in their school, and they make sure it's carried out over time. Training is, is a second critical uh, component to the program. Committee members are trained for two full days, and they in turn help to train all of the staff at school, including the bus drivers, the custodians, the non-teaching staff that I mentioned earlier. Third, we, um, we mentioned this earlier, the importance of surveying students about bullying. Well, the Olveas program includes a 40-item self-report measure that really includes lots of detailed information about uh, the types of bullying that occur, how frequently, where they occur at school, and kids' attitudes about bullying. And, and these data are so critical to help plan your program, help assess it over time, and really motivate folks to, to jump in and, and implement the program. Staff discussion groups, that these are ongoing learning and sharing opportunities during faculty meetings or uh, grade level or team level meetings to, to keep motivation and learning high. Um, and a fifth component at the school level is involves establishing rules about bullying. Um, and flip to the next slide just to show those, and I think we may have a call coming in after that. We have found that it's critical to make very explicit with kids uh, what our expectations are for their bullying behavior. These are the four Olbeas bullying rules that most schools adopt, and as you can see, it's important to establish rule number one, that we won't bully others, but it's, it's equally important to really set expectations about other kids' behaviors. So we will try to help students who are bullied. We'll try to include those who are left out. And if we know somebody is being bullied, we'll tell an adult at school, an adult at home. These really focus on the behavior of the bystanders. How are we trying to shape kids' bystander behaviors? Well, uh, having been to uh, Gale School, we saw this in action, and it's just mm -hmm. really, uh, it, it, it works. It's just wonderful to see. We do have a call right now. Uh, Sherry from Salt Lake City, Utah, we welcome you to Solutions. And you, do you have a question for Dr. Limber? Uh, yes. Uh, I am a mediator, and I have been involved with schools with truancy mediation, and I know some schools um, who have tried to use a conflict resolution approach. And so I was very interested to hear what you had to say about it not being appropriate for bullying. And I was wondering, um, in, in find the situation re-victimizing the person who has been bullied. If you'd just say more about that. Sure. Um, and, and let me stress again that I think there are many situations where med mediation is, is, is really critical. And, and so let me say a little bit more about why it may, may not be the, the thing to, to, to use in bullying situations. Um, we, we hear from a number of children who've, who've been bullied that the last thing that they want to do is to face their tormentor. Now, I know in, in good mediation, you don't force any issue. <laughs> right. And if they don't want to face the, the, the child or the individual who's been tormenting them, that, that wouldn't be pushed. Um, in, in some cases, that's not paid enough attention to, I think, and that's, that can be problematic. Or sometimes kids, especially if there's peer mediation involved, and, and one may worry a little bit about the training of the peers doing the mediation, we want to make, you know, really, really certain that they're not forced into a situation that's at all uncomfortable. Um, I alluded to also that, that we want to make sure we, s we send the right messages, that, um, that, you know, it's not where we're needed. We're not trying to work out an issue between you. We really are trying to send the message that this bullying is inappropriate and it really needs to stop, and the message to the child being bullied is um, this is a horrible thing that's happened to you, and we as adults are really going to do everything that we can to to put a stop to it. Okay, thank you. Sure, thanks for calling, Sherry. Yeah, thanks for calling, Sherry. And uh, Sue, you ready to move on? Sure. Let me say a, a few more things about some of the school-level components to the program. On slide 28, um, it's, we find it very important. Um, one of the tasks of this coordinating committee I referred to is 
really to review and refine the school's supervisory system so that bullying is is less likely to happen. So what's involved in that? Well, number one is determining what are the hot spots for bullying at our school. Um, you can determine that fairly readily from looking at the, the kids' responses on the questionnaire. And once we know that, what are our strategies for increasing adult supervision in those hot spots? We know that bullying thrives where we're not present or we're not being vi- vigilant. Um, a seventh school level component is really kicking the program off. We, we typically do that at the start of a school semester, and we found that um, it's really important for adults to show to kids uh, in a school assembly or in, in other sort of exciting, flashy ways that, that we are taking this, serious, this issue very slur- seriously and we're, we're going to be closely monitoring and that things are going to change at the school. Um, and last but not least, parents um, are actively involved in the, the program and planning for the program and serving on the coordinating committee and really being kept informed throughout the program. The next slide highlights um, some of the classroom level components, which are also critical, not just to set school-wide structures in place and activities, but what happens in the classroom level to make bullying less likely. Number one, um, as we see on slide number 29, it's it's really critical to to post and enforce those school-wide rules. Um, um, the rules and policies really do nothing if they're not enforced consistently in each and every classroom. One of the most important parts of the Obeus program, and you'll see this um, so well depicted in the video on the website, um, are class meetings that we recommend be held about once a week for a full class period. This is a time when the books are put away, you circle the kids around, and you talk with the kids about bullying peer relations, and other issues of concern to them. We found through research that those teachers who really systematically hold these classroom meetings show a greater reduction in bullying than those who don't. Um, and parent meetings at the, at the classroom level seem also important in helping to address those climate issues within a classroom. Now, the next slide I won't spend a lot of time on, but to, to really focus a little bit more on why these classroom meetings are so important. Not only do they teach uh, kids about bullying and the rules about bullying and related issues, but they're really all about helping kids learn more about themselves and others in the classroom and really building that sense of community uh, in the class. They're time that that, uh, also helps the teacher keep his or her finger on the pulse of kids' concerns um, and sometimes is a, a, a an appropriate forum for addressing bullying situations that may be cropping up in the classroom. The individual level components of the program, um, I list on slide number 31, we find, again, it's that supervision is critical to reducing bullying. We have found that it's important that all staff in the school, not just teachers and administrators, but every adult in the school know how to intervene on the spot if and when they see bullying happens. It shouldn't be something that the cafeteria worker has to witness and not knowing how to, and not know how to intervene or whether they are empowered to intervene. Every adult should be able to, to call it when they see it and do something that will um, address it on the spot. It, it shouldn't stop there, of course. So a third component is to hold meetings with the students involved separately after the fact with the individuals who've been bullied and separately with those who are doing the bullying to really better understand what's going on and to to provide support in the former case and some corrective actions in the latter case. And then finally, there may be some individual intervention plans that are needed, some additional counseling or other assistance that, that both of those groups of kids may need. And then finally, the community level components. We know that bullying thrives in schools but doesn't stop at the schoolhouse doors. So we recognize that the community involvement is is important not only to have, for example, community members on this coordinating team for the school, um, but it's important to really um, find community groups that can support the program in different ways in your school. How can you partner with other organizations in the school to provide financial support or human support or public relations support for what's going on in your school. 
And as well, um, the third point, how do we spread this anti-bullying message and principles of best practice to the broader community, to kids in uh, youth programs or uh, vacation Bible school or other uh, places where kids gather in the community, bullying can thrive there too. So how do we make sure there's sort of a seamless message within a community? So those are the, the primary components of the program. Hopefully gave folks a, a bit of a glimpse into what this, this comprehensive program can look like. Well, uh, you sh- certainly helped me um, understand the, um, the issue in, in more depth and the complexity of the issue. Um, it, was, it was wonderful for us to be able to actually visit a school that was implementing this program because we did get to see all of this in action, and it makes a lot more sense when um, sure. you can actually see it in action. Sure. And, 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 and the impressive part of that for me was that um, – it was not uh, that we just w- that we only saw a group of kids who were brought in to tell us about the program, but we roamed around through the school, and every child in that school, um, um, you know, n- knew about bullying. Could give you a definition of bullying. Um, this, uh, w- while they may not have been able to repeat this bullying circle, they certainly had an awareness and understanding Great, yeah. of what that was all about. So it was wonderful to. Uh, be able to see that. Hats off to Gail and her crew there. Absolutely. They've done a terrific job, and we enjoyed our visit there. Well, I think it's um, about the end of the the road here today. Yeah, we're actually a little over time, but that's that's the great part of a radio webcast. We can go a little shorter or we can go a little longer. We're not really confined to an hour. But once again, um, this hour has really flown by, and uh, we appreciate the contributions of all of our callers uh, made on the program today. if uh, any of you were left waiting on the line, we regret that we uh, couldn't take your call. But um, but, but we certainly um, have enjoyed this time in, with, with all of you today, with your callers and those we didn't talk to, and with especially having Sue here in the studio with us. This has been great. Now, I, I just want to take this moment again to remind our listeners that all the resources that we've reviewed today are listed on the website for this radio webcast. And like all our monthly programs, it will be archived, so you can go back and listen again. Uh, please recommend to your friends and colleagues that they listen and uh, use the archive program for professional development for the entire faculty or community group, especially if you're interested in Elvaeus. I think this will be a great introduction to all of them. And don't forget, we're on Solutions is on iTunes. This is our greatest <laughs> coup. I love it. Well, our special guest for this month has been Dr. Sue Limber. Sue, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. It's a real um, pleasure. Thanks so much. It's been so a much. great presentation. Um, good questions from our audience, and you fielded Absolutely. them well. And um, you've got information in the PowerPoint for um, people to learn more about the program or how they might ask um, additional questions that they were not able to answer on this program. Yes, thank my thanks as well, Sue. Thanks for having me. Uh, if anyone would like to contact Dr. Limber with some additional questions, go through uh, the National Dropout Prevention Center email address, which I'll give you now. It's ndpc, as in National Dropout Prevention Center, ndpc at clemson.edu, and we will make sure that any of your questions get forwarded to, to Sue. So uh, we appreciate your being here with us, Sue, today. These radio webcasts will be broadcast uh, at 3.30 p.m. Uh, monthly on the fourth Tuesday of each month. So check the webpage for the exact, exact dates and content of each broadcast. Our next program, we will look at the strategy of service learning. It's set for June 24th and will feature Joan Liptrop, the director of the Institute for Global Education and Service Learning. And in the true spirit of service learning, Joan will be bringing along a high school student, Mike Schwartzbar, to be on the program with us. Both will be in town as they are involved in the facilitation of the National Dropout Prevention Center's Summer Institute on Service Learning that week. So we're looking forward to having them join us, Sam, in the studio. We've got an extra seat over there for Mike, and we're ready to go. Great. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, so look for the resources for this program, which we're collecting even as we speak, uh, which will be put up on the website two weeks before the live broadcast, so you can prepare yourself for the next program. And this current webcast will be available to listen to again within uh, the next two hours on our website, www.dropoutprevention.org, slash webcast. And it is downloadable, as we've mentioned before, for your iPod or MP3 players. 
So thanks to all of you for listening and participating. Um, remember, we know why students are dropping out of school, and with research-based solutions, we can assure that all of our students graduate. Join us next month for more Solutions to the Dropout Crisis.